welcome everybody to today's webinar, how to monitor and, and improve core web vitals. I'm joined today by Bianca and Sumitra. Really excited with the combination here. Bianca is our in-house uh, core web vitals expert, and she's the product lead of Real User Monitoring, which, which they've been working on displaying those core web vital metrics um, and helping teams really kind of dive into them and, and, and find ways to improve their scores. Uh, and then we've got Sumitra, uh, and she's kind of got that practical element. Being an engineer, she was um, managing our marketing website and looking at ways to improve and looking at optimization optimizations. So she's going to come in from the perspective of practical tips and things that she's learned along the way as well to give you some of those actionable uh, takeaways. So that's going to be really cool having the two of those. Um, we'll, we'll move through and the agenda today is we'll kick it off with Bianca and she'll kind of give us that base level of what are core web vitals and why we should care. Um, and then we'll get into a demo, monitoring and improving core web vitals in Raygun. Uh, we'll then hand it over to Sumitra, who will run through the common core web vital killers and how to identify and resolve them. Uh, and then we'll jump back into Raygun and look at how we can track those scores over, over time and start to see what is effective and, and you know, how can uh, you get more of the things that have the biggest impact uh, on those scores. And then we'll kick into the Q&A and just just so you know, we're going to give about 10 or 15 minutes for QA. and I'm going to be sitting over here uh, fielding any questions and I'm going to be putting them in at the bottom of the slide deck so we get to them at the end. So please use the Q&A um, feature in Zoom. Again, it's at the bottom of that screen in the Zoom, in the Zoom view. Um, answer, ask any questions there and we'll try and order and get to them at the end of the presentation. So yeah, we always love a bit of interaction. So please use that feature. We'd love to answer your questions. Uh, for those folks that don't know, I'll just quickly run through what Raygun is. Essentially, it's a modern suite of tools for error and performance monitoring. Today, we're really going to be diving into that front-end performance, um, particularly around that user experience using these modern uh, user-centric metrics. A couple of things that we really hang our hat on here at Raygun is being customer-centric. All our data is based on real users, and we tie you know, performance issues or errors to specific users so you can really understand how that exact user has experienced your application or website. Um, we're actionable, so you know, you'll probably see a little bit of Bianca showing some of these trends, so you can start to see some issues in your website or application, so you can then dive into it, and then we give you an insane amount of detail, kind of getting to the bottom, getting to the crux of that issue. Uh, we're full stack, so across our three products, real user monitoring, crash reporting, and APM, we can uh, monitor the front end, back end on performance, as well as errors, and we're easy to set up. So it works seamlessly with the tools you love. Uh, with real user monitoring that we'll be talking about today, it's, it's a few lines of code. It can get set up uh, literally in minutes. Um, so yeah, if that sounds like you or for your existing customer just using crash, uh, you know, it's very worthwhile uh, checking out RUM. Uh, doesn't take much time and, and you can start seeing that data flow and, and get the value out of that. Hand it over to Bianca. I'll be over here answering any questions. Uh, enjoy the slides. Bianca, take it away. All right. Thanks, Andre. And thanks, all of you, for joining. It is far too early in the morning for me to be doing this. So if I don't make any sense, leave anything important out, please do use that Q&A function and put in a question so we can answer it later on. But I'll try my best to bring this topic of core vitals closer to you. Um, it is a bit of a mystery topic, but we're pretty um, excited about it here at Reagan. And I hope at the end of the webinar, you will be at least a little bit excited about it as well. So what are these core vitals? Um, so Google says they're just part of their strategy to put user experience at the center of measuring website performance. And it does fit with their shift to putting mobile first. Um, there is a couple of other things that um, they're encouraging us to do, which is making websites accessible, making them secure, and so on. Um, but for today, we're focusing on these three new metrics that they've introduced specifically for measuring user experience. Um, and they have also said they're going to be using them for their search ranking algorithm. So Yes, it's about user experience, but also it will have an effect on how you rank in a Google search if you don't adhere to these new standards. So kind of a big deal. And while Google is emphasizing that the change is gradual, uh, they have announced these new metrics a year early, 
and that's quite unusual for them. So they've given us a year to prepare. That year has passed. So really about time to uh, get into it and look at how this works. So the three metrics are largest contentful paint. That's probably the easiest one to kind of wrap your head around. We already have first paint. We have first contentful paint. Um, largest contentful paint is the kind of next logical step. From a user's point of view, this is about looking at when does the website seem almost ready? So when can I start reading an, an article while kind of the rest of the content loads in the background? Um, now, first input delay is about interaction. When I, can I do something with a website? So it doesn't apply to all websites because not all web, web, websites require interaction, but most of them do because it includes things like navigation menus and so on. So when can I click on a menu, navigate away from a page, put some text into a field and so on? How long does that take for the page to load to that point? Now, the third metric, that's, a, that's actually a new one. So new that you can only natively track it in Chromium browsers at the moment. Um, and it's not like the other two, a, a time-based metric, but in fact, it's a score. So cumulative layout shift measures how much a page jumps around while it's loading. And I think this is probably one that we can all really relate to, especially on mobile. It's so annoying when you open up a web page, you start reading something, or even worse, you try and click a button. And just in that moment, you're trying to click on it. It jumps down because a picture pops up or an ad or a pop up or something. and you click on the wrong thing. So I know myself, I get super annoyed by this and I have navigated away from pages like that entirely because I couldn't even deal with it. And that's why um, this metric is now introduced to specifically measure that as the kind of annoyance factor in user experience. Now, in addition to introducing these metrics for measuring uh, performance, Google has also set up some thresholds uh, for which they consider to be good, mediocre, and poor performance for each of the metrics. And you have to pass the threshold for good performance in order to pass by Google standards. Um, and this is important because these thresholds are actually really, really tough, um, especially if you've got a website that isn't optimized for mobile because maybe mainly your uh, your customers are coming on desktop, like they do for Raygun, for example, um, then it's really hard to uh, do well on these metrics. Not only because the thresholds themselves are quite hard to reach for each of the metrics, but because Google has also said, you will need to pass the good performance threshold for 75% of page loads in the last 28 days. So it's three hurdles to pass. And so it's not really surprising that the majority of websites currently do not pass. And chances are um, your offerings might not either. Spoiler alert, ours doesn't either. We'll come back to that later. Um, so a couple of numbers here that I have found. The Chrome UX report at the end of last year reported 76% of all uh, the websites, all the data going into um, the Crux data set didn't pass um, the standards for core vitals. So that's the overall ones. They might've passed for some of the metrics, but not on this 75%, 28 days timeframe. It looked even more bleak for e-commerce. So 87% of e-commerce websites failed. And now you might think, well, that was end of last year. Surely things have gotten better since. Just had a look yesterday, the latest numbers coming out beginning of June barely any improvement. I think just about 30% of websites overall are passing now, but still a huge way to go. There have though also been some reports of uh, companies doing really well on improving uh, user experience scores and actually a correlation directly to uh, conversion and sales. So I've picked out two that I found here one um, was Adidas. They just looked into improving page response time overall, not specifically core web vitals, but they found an immediate uptick in conversions. Really interesting case study that they've published there, or the agency has published. 
And then there's the Vodafone case study uh, published on the on the Google Web Dev pages themselves that was specifically looking at improving the largest contentful paint metric. And they found that improving that by 30%, which, you know, that seems achievable. Um, so Mitra will tell us how to achieve that later on, but 30% improvement in LCP increased their sales by um, 8%. So pretty um, impressive numbers. And of course, cool advices aren't just about sales and uh, shopping cards and making sure people don't close the pages if the shopping cart is loading too slow, but it's affecting you know, retention of users, leads, um, probably your ad sales as well because of the implications on search ranking. So it's really across the board uh, of all industries. And we can relate, as I've mentioned. So I've, I've picked up a screenshot here from PageSpeed Insights, um, ironically from our own blog post, um, the first one that we had on Corvette Vitals. So um, you can see here, I've got some work to do, particularly on the uh, largest contentful paint. I'll show you that again later on. But in general, we are obviously welcoming this move to putting customer experience, user experience at the center. And um, this is what we're all about at Raygun. And we think now the time has never better to get on the journey of continuously improving um, the customer experience. And we really recommend not just making a one-off effort now to pass the Google standard in order not to get penalized for a search ranking. Google has already said, this is just the start. They've given us a head start of a year for three metrics, uh, but they've also said there will be more. They'll keep introducing new metrics to move towards user experience. And so it's a really good time to rethink how we optimize our um, websites and web offerings for, for our customers. On top of that, we also think it's a great chance to get your marketing team and your engineering team closer together because with these three core web vitals, they have uh, a shared language, they have a shared goal to work towards um, and so they can work closer together. Some of the improvements um, can be made by marketing, some of them by engineers, all of them together. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to get them to work um, together more and actually even to combine those tools. So we're showing PageSpeed Insights here. We are using it ourselves. Our recommendation is really to use these tools that you are already familiar with from Google in parallel with a real user monitoring tool um, to get the full picture to get um, all the insights with the real data from your real users. And even though the Google Chrome team is recommending to do just that, so who are we to um, not agree? Um, so what are we trying to achieve in this webinar is, yes, we wanna um, explain what Corbett Vitals are, but really you wanna give you more ways to understand what your user's experience is on your pages and to provide you with some workflows so that you can make sure that those crucial parts of your website perform well for your customers. Oh, oh, <laughs> cool. So with that, let's jump into a live demo because why not? Um, bear with me if things aren't quite going fast enough uh, because we are we're working with our beta website so that I can give you a sneak preview on um, sneak preview on some upcoming features. So challenging to work the slides at the same time as talking. Let's see if I can manage. Here we go. We should all be seeing Reagan. Great. Notes here. See those two. Excellent. So here we are, real user monitoring in the Raygun suite. For those of you who have not used it um, yet or haven't seen it yet, this is what it looks like. We are here on the performance overview um, for real user monitoring. Again, this is real data. This is, um, we're using all the data from your customers, all of it, no sampling, no filtering of data unless you set that up that way. So you've got 
the correct representation of all the traffic coming to your website. And to make it even more real, we are using our, our own blog here. I've showed you on the screenshot before, we've got our work cut out. Um, and you will see here when we're looking at these metrics that that is certainly true. So in this graph, you get an overview of how things are going overall. Um, over time, uh, we have all these modern performance metrics here. These three should look familiar by now. Um, the core vitals, of course. And you'll see here, yes, ooh, lots of spikes. So at this stage, normally we recommend looking at the 90th percentile and 99th percentile in order to um, select the group of people that have the worst experience, so you can the largest impact for improvements. In the context of core vitals, uh, we recommend looking at the 75th percentile because this is what um, Google will be looking at, and this is the threshold that you have to be passing. So for LCP, the good threshold is 2.5 seconds, and yeah, that's not looking like we're really getting that one. What else do we have on this overview page? Um, is the, the list of the most requested pages. So you can, you can see how things are going for individual pages. And in fact, that's exactly what we're gonna do next. Because this graph gives you um, an indication how things are going overall. It doesn't quite tell you where you should start, um, which one is the most pressing issue, how can you prioritize, and where it puts your effort for fixes. Uh, so let's instead pick one of our most requested and slowest pages. So in this list, you can already see where things might be going particularly poorly. Uh, and let's pick this one here. And now we're on the performance overview for this individual static page. Um, on this histogram over here on the top, you can see the distribution um, for specific cohorts of people. You can see how many people are in these um, cohorts. This is just looking at load time overall. The color um, coding indicates how you're doing against industry standards. And we've got the median and the P90s, um, the 90s percentile here as well. So you can see how uh, your page loads and uh, the fact that users are distributed for the load time. Again, typically we recommend going into this 99th percentile, improving things there, making sure you've got big impact. But in this webinar, we are interested in the core vitals. And so we have dedicated a whole new module to them here. And uh, this probably looks familiar because we've used the same um, visual presentation as Google does in their tools. So uh, we have got the overall average score. Important, this is an average across all the page loads, not the median. So sometimes it can look a bit strange at first glance that you know your average is, is five seconds, but the distribution doesn't seem to suggest that um, this number is correct. So um, we've got the traffic light bars showing the load distribution. Uh, so again, this is using the thresholds that Google has set. You can see of your page loads, I'll come back to why that is an important thing to point out, but of all the page loads on the specific page, 22.4% are having a good experience as per the Google's thresholds. And these are all the ones we really wanna move into the green area and some of the red as well in order to be hitting that 70 percentile. Uh, let's see, CLS is actually looking pretty good for this page. Not really unusual, this is a blog, blog page. It doesn't have all that much content that is getting loaded and we don't have any ads on there and nothing to really slow it down. Um, but for um, other websites, there might be more of this. So Mitra is gonna tell you a little bit more details shortly. So if you now wanna see what Google will be looking at for um, their scoring, we recommend setting the time frame here to one month. And 
switching here to just look at mobile traffic. So that is what Google is doing currently, mobile traffic um, only for their scoring. Of course, it's really about putting mobile first and making sure that mobile pages are optimized, but they've already indicated desktop is coming next. So you can't just um, focus on this. But for now, this would be what Google looks at. We would very clearly fail on all accounts for this page, lots of work to do. Um, great, so we now know probably a good place to start first in for today where we're doing the worst or maybe LCP as well where fixes might be easier, but how do we decide um, what to do and how to start? Well, we can look a little bit further down this page we're getting um, the waterfall loading time of what's happening. I guess it's aggregated for all the users, but it might give us an indication of some things that are um, particularly slow. Ooh, look at this, some JavaScript that is taking a long time. So that might be a good place to start. But if we want to know more detail, here is where our heart piece is coming in and, and this preview of upcoming functionality for those who are already familiar with RUM. Um, this is where real user monitoring really comes into strength. So while Google has said it's all about user experience, they are still looking at page loads. We're also looking at page loads to have the same numbers, but in addition, we are correlating this to affected users. So page loads, not equaling users, you can imagine it might be actually a small group of users with a particularly poor performance that keeps loading pages because they're too slow and actually contributes um, more to this cohort of poor performance page loads um, than others. So we want to give you a chance to understand how many of my customers are really affected by this and who are these customers. So we can drill into this group. If this was a little trick, let's uh, maybe do that again, if I can go back actually. Cool, let's go back and do that again in case it was too quick. So what I've done here is on the largest content for paint, on the segment for poor performance, click on it, drill in. And what I see now is all these sessions that are correlated and um, that fall into the segment, all these um, user, real user sessions that have a poor performance for largest contentful paint. And this is the step we recommend for identifying some patterns and trying to find out what do these people have in common. Now that they're all in Chrome is probably not unusual and Windows 10 is pretty popular too. But I think what immediately stands out in this list of people is a lot of traffic coming from India. Now, of course, we have readers in India as well, but probably not that many of ours. We're based in New Zealand. We get a lot of um, visitors from here. We get a lot of visitors from the US, some from India, not that many. Something might be affecting specifically those people um, accessing our blog from there. But let's find out a little bit more detail about that. So what we can do from here is drill further into the session and see what really happened for this user in that session specifically and find out a little bit more details about them maybe, where exactly where they're coming from. 25 second loading time is, that is quite long. Um, that would be annoying, I can relate to that. They only visited this one page. If they visited more, we can see um, the whole order of visits here with the timings. And now to get even more granular, we can go into the specific session for the specific user on the specific page. So we'll see again here, this waterfall timeline of loading uh, for this specific instance. And so now we can say, what might be happening there. Of course, everything is taking a little bit long, but what we can see immediately is a lot of latency. So this might indicate that people are on, uh, this person is on a slow internet connection or uh, maybe 
we don't have a data point that is nearby them to really serve that page correctly. Uh, but this gives a good indication of what might be causing this issue. Um, and if we want to make sure that our suspicion is correct, we, oops, all right, how do I get back? We go back to the Overboot page, the aggregated data, and set this filter to exclude all the traffic from India in this case, and have a look at, okay, how, how are our, our scores looking now? And um, were we correct in assuming that maybe it's this specific cohort of users that has issues? And if um, we leave them out, does it improve the numbers? So this is just to validate our suspicion that something is happening there. Um, obviously it's not fixing it, but it gives you a chance to narrow down and really diagnose what's going on. And you can set more filters um, such as uh, browsers and operating systems, even devices to really narrow down on these issues and validate where things might be going wrong. Of course, you can also do that the other way around um, and set the filters up for a specific group of users that you wanna make sure uh, the performance is really, really good for. So if you have got a very defined group of customers, for example, and you wanna make sure that they get the best experience, we're setting these filters accordingly. Great. Now, we know what an issue might be. We know where the issue might be and for, for whom. Uh, we still don't know exactly what we can do to fix it. And what we're recommending here is use one of the Google tools. PageSpeed Insights is really great at giving you some suggestions of um, what to fix. And uh, we recommend having a look at that, but then coming back into RUM to validate that suggestion as well. So Google um, page insight specifically is using uh, some field data. So that is real user traffic, but it's not specifically representative of your real user traffic and it's not all of your traffic. So, and they're looking at the website as a whole, not, um, and not segmented by geolocation and so on. So take that recommendation that they're making, look into RUM with a specific group of users you wanna optimize for and see if that makes sense there as well. And then go out and carry, carry the fixes. Um, and I'll show you what to do after that. But in between, I'll hand over to Sumitra to talk you through some of the most common issues that we've seen and identified and how you might go about fixing them. Oops. So maybe we'll just go back here. And hand over to Sumitra. Hello, awesome. Thank you, Bianca, for that. And what a demo that was. It was it's gonna be really handy for uh, when we refer back to it in terms of how we can use the features in Raygun uh, to diagnose into common core web vitals. So I feel like with these metrics, people tend to get carried away with just trying to get into the green zone and really trying to get those numbers low. But we all need to remember that at the end of the day, these metrics are to help you with your uh, user experience for your customers. So it's kind of almost as if Google kind of pulled out the, hey, if you're not gonna do it, we're gonna force you to basically do it. So. Yeah, um, these metrics are really going to help you in terms of giving your users the most mindful and at ease user experience as possible. So for each metric, I would like to present their killers along with some common issues that could come across and also ways to identify and resolve them. Oh, sorry, there we go. <laughs> uh, so uh, largest contains of paint. This generally refers to the largest asset on the page and is it a massive heading or could it be a piece of image or another piece of content? Uh, so with largest contentful paint, there's always going to be a largest contentful paint. No matter what you do to improve that metric, it will always be there. But in this case, it's all about really minimizing the load times and how speedy it can necessarily be. So not actually really about eliminating the whole content overall. 
Um, and usually with this um, metric here, the common killer can be just poor performing content and some issues that you could come across um, are large images for the content. So this could be due to large images and large bits of content just all around the show. Um, and also not just rendering for certain screen sizes, but also for various screen sizes as well. So an example in this case could be a super high quality image that you could have optimized for desktop, uh, but you are rendering on a mobile uh, view. Um, so in this example that you can see on the right here, um, it's really the largest contentful paint is the last part of your um, page to load. Whereas the first contentful paint, the text is loaded, but once that largest contentful plate comes through, it's their hero images, which could be the assets on the side as well. And so um, when I was doing discovery on the blog uh, for improving our Core Web Vital metrics, uh, I used Raygun's waterfall timeline chart, which is what Bianca mentioned as well just before. Um, and this helped me understand what the biggest assets were. And what's really awesome about this specific feature in Raygun is that you can filter down what uh, medias you want. So I do not want the doc um, filter and I don't want the XHR media. So um, what I can do is essentially eliminate this. And what's even better is that you can actually export the um, timeline as well into a CVS and you can, in the CVS, do whatever the heck you want with it. Do you want to, um, uh, I guess, manage it by the largest uh, load times and I think that really helped with just understanding what specific content I really needed to uh, focus on. Uh, so my focus was the visual assets in this case. So I re removed the unnecessary media from the timeline itself from the filters. Uh, so this metric, uh, it usually refers to uh, images, like I said before, or blocks of text. So that is what's visible in the viewpoint as such. Uh, so visually taking a look as well at the above the fold content on your page, you can really get a glimpse of what assets in your page uh, tend to be the largest assets themselves. So even just taking a look with the naked eye could also help too. Uh, so a couple of ways that I was able to um, come up with some solutions to come uh, resolve these certain, the certain metric itself um, could be just as simply as everyone may know is the compress the images. And I tend to use compresspng.com and also SVG OMG by Jake Archibald. And what's even great is that these two services are free. So you don't have to pay a penny, which you know, we all love free things. Um, and also going back to uh, rendering per screen size as well, it's important to note that you are using the appropriate images per screen size and per density. So what's the point in necessarily rendering a high quality content for a mobile view? Like I mentioned before, there's not too much, especially if it doesn't make a visual difference. In this case, this is where the source set attribute for image tags come into play. You are able to actually um, spot on, be able to manage and put down specifically what um, type of images you want per screen size um, and also per density of the image as well in the attribute. And so first impressions actually really count both in the real world and on the web too. The first input delay really captures the user's quality of experience by measuring its interactivity along with its responsiveness. And as you can see in this example here, it's the two points in the middle that really count the most. And it's all about basically the responsiveness that you get back from the, you give back to the user after, in this, in this example here, after they have clicked the button. Is it speedy or are they having to wait a little bit of time? Um, so the slowest responsiveness the slower the response in this is um, that the user is getting back, the higher the first input delay um, metric will be. So uh, the common killer tends to be for this metric, too many calls in the main thread. Uh, the common issues that come across are usually loading non-critical assets. Um, and this could be loading content that is way down the line on your page still is somewhere else in the area that you're not necessarily needing in that point of moment where you are um, outputting a uh, certain event listener. Um, and also using third party tools as well that are in currently loading in, in the certain time, but you're not actually necessarily using it. Um, this could be like such as like marketing tools or A-B testing tools or even just general development tools as well. Um, also lengthy JavaScript and CSS as well. Um, 
that are not necessarily required or you don't use them anymore. It's just typical debt that's been building up over time that you haven't gotten rid of on your site can also be another common issue. Uh, and how you can identify issues on this metric. Um, I use Raygun's traffic like bar tool that Bianca actually uh, demoed just before. And what's great is that again, it's designed for core web vitals in mind. So you can see here that you can actually, um, we actually do have in the beta mode at the moment that you can actually drill down to see the amount of affected users um, affected and also be able to prioritize um, what is necessary to solve in that moment do, is the first input delay something that you want to be resolving uh for mobile at the moment and how many users are affected by it as well is that a priority for you at the moment uh so ways to resolve the low score on this metric is by code splitting and only by code splitting you are only rendering necessary code within the um certain functionality that you are outputting to the user um, you can also be loading above the fold content functionality that could be prioritized over upcoming functionality as well. This is when the async and defer attributes in the JavaScript um, tag come in really handy too. And of course, minifying and removing your CSS too, that um, you may have situations where you have some CSS just, again, just building up with technical debt that you no longer need. And if you don't need it, you may as well remove it um, because again, it is all about rendering only what is critical in that moment. Um, and of course, there's also reconsidering your third party tools, which may be a hard decision to make, but easy to remove as well. And it's obviously going to be a wider decision as well, maybe not just in development teams at, at some places, but also with um, other teams of work of such as marketing as well, if you are wanting to get rid of marketing tools. And it's going to make a huge difference, but it is definitely going to be a hard decision to make. So moving on to my favorite metric, which you might find funny as my favorite, um, cognitive layout shifts. So um, Google Web Dev's website uh, mentions a couple of great points in their articles, which is where I went to do my research at some stages. Um, so within this example here on the right, particularly, um, you can see that this is actually a on load example, but the circumstances actually apply to other, other times when you are changing content on the page as well, such as, on click events or um, on change events. So um, as you can see in this example, um, the bit of content that loads first is the text and some buttons and some um, of the navigation as well. But then the images come into play. And at first, this may not seem like a major problem as well. Like, you know, you might, you might be concerned and being like, okay, that's fine. It's just the images loading. But if we put ourselves in the reader shoes, um, and you were to read this article, especially when that text appears on load and then the images come across. Um, you might have your site fixated on the text that was above. And then once the images are loaded, your site is having to move down unexpectedly. And if you actually think about it, it's really going to be a cause of frustration and a lack of experience, um, a lack of good experience for your customers as well. So even simple text like this can really hinder your user experience itself. So at a glance, it may not seem like a big problem, but it really is. And that is why this is my favorite metric because it really does define what good experience um, should be. Um, so a common killer for this metric here is just unexpected rendering of content. And common issues that usually occur with this one is images that don't have a width and height um, set. And as you can see here in the example, they don't have a width and height set if they did, there would be some reserved space, um, some white space on load. And that means that the text won't be able to move down. Um, another common issue that could occur, like I just said, elements with no reserved space. So elements don't necessarily refer to images, but they could refer to a bit of text that you are, or a bit of data or a bit of content that you're gonna render in a certain place that you haven't actually kept any reserved space for. Um, and of course, there's also a lack of, um, content just staying in its place and content jumping around on screen again, as you can see in the example. Uh, so page speed insights is what I used as well for when I was doing discovery on the blog to improve our metrics. But I noticed that the data showing is only for the past 28 days. I didn't want data just for the past 28 days. I wanted it to expand for quite some time. So what was an, another 
really not so nice thing about PageSpeed Insights as well is that the data collected was only for um, Chrome users, I'm pretty sure, but only um, users that are only opted in for being able to collect Core Web Vitals for us. So the metrics were quite skewed and they were pretty misleading. So it was a bit of a risk to be following PageSpeed Insights results. Uh, so this is where um, Pregun really came into play. Um, again, with their um, traffic light graph for Core Web Vitals, it was really handy to be able to measure over time where these metrics stand and also be able to apply the time range filters that I want. And what's great is that in Raygun, I was able to either go from a day all the way to two months to see what the metrics were. So I wasn't just isolated to the 28 days. And that is really handy if I do want a big time span of the time range to be able to reflect back on what exactly the metric stands at. Uh, so thankfully, and what's really great is that this metric here is actually really easy to resolve. But if you are stuck, I would suggest adding the width and height attributes on the good old image tag that came back around nice again. Uh, these attributes, again, like they already exist for the image tag itself. So um, if like, this is pretty easy to, it's just easy to plug in and go with these images. And it may not seem ideal at first, but it's actually going to create a big, huge improvement on your user experience. Um, and also just, if you, if that's just images, what about the other content as well? You're probably thinking like that's just images. So keeping reserved space for any type of uh, specific content that you expect to fill with da um, data is quite ideal. Um, and this could be such as an empty box or empty white box that just has a width and height um, set in the CSS and this will get filled with data later. That there alone is going to make a huge difference as well. And if you're not ke too keen on keeping reserved space, you're maybe not too much of a fan of seeing that white space on your page. Um, in terms of um, an example could be with banner elements, I would recommend overlaying your elements on the screen. So this will mean that you aren't having to create reserved space, but you are having um, essentially your elements the way you would like to treat them as such. Cool. So I'm going to hand it back over to Bianca now to give you guys another exciting demo on how to benefit your core web vitals. So off you, Bianca. Awesome. Thanks, Samitra. Let's just switch back to the app and, and see. Here we go. So a ton of fixes that you can carry out to improve your core web vitals. Might well, seem like a lot to do actually, but some of them are quite easy to do while others might be harder. And uh, showing you some ways of um, prioritizing the things that need to be done for your specific group of users. Um, I'd also like to um, reiterate that really get your marketing and engineering teams working together on prioritizing these fixes and then going away and fixing what they can do respectively or maybe even do it together. Um, but also making sure that what they have done to improve is having the desired effect. And this is the other big advantage that using a real user monitoring tool in parallel with the Google tools has for you is because you probably don't want to wait 28 days until you can see the impact in PageSpeed Insights or Lighthouse or, or your um, Search Console reports. You want to see immediately did um, this fix that I just deployed work. Um, and so come back onto the performance overview page for your whole app, or maybe for um, the specific static page if you've done fixes for a specific area of your website. And again, look at this time frame. We had it set to one month to reflect what Google was doing. Now we might want to go to the last week or even last couple of days just to see um, what happened to your metrics. Are they trending downwards? And so if you've previously had filters set, make sure you've got those set again as well. So you're not comparing apples and oranges and look at the metric that you wanted to improve for. Well, I picked a bad example here with this going up, but yeah, let's stay with it. Um, we'll toggle this off again to look at the 75th percentile 
And we can see, I mean, we didn't deploy any fixes here, so nothing is changing. But hopefully when you do this, you see a clear downward trend for your 75th percentile um, since you made that deployment. And to make that even easier to see what happened since the last deployment, we recommend turning deployment tracking on uh, so you can see exactly the time and place when this fix has been um, deployed, you get the exact values at that point in time, and you can compare them to the values you're getting now. Great. So um, in summary, we recommend starting on your Pull of Vitals journey now if you haven't already. It's a great chance to get ahead of uh, your competition. We've seen the stats. Chances are they're not doing this yet. Um, so do this well. Um, for your search rankings, but don't just stop there. Um, really take this as an inspiration to start working on improving, continuously improving your customer experience um, on your on your websites and be ready for the next um, additional changes and metrics to come. Great, how are we doing for time? I think it's looking all good. Let us jump into q and I'd say. So I'll switch back to the slides very quickly to so that you can see those uh, questions that Andre has been adding in the meantime. Okay. There we go. Let me share those slides again. Great. Let's get into it. So is the CLS metric measured over the life of the page? For example, if a customer is using accordion type layouts for areas of content, will that affect CLS? Well, great question to get to yes. start with. I'll hand it over to you. Yes, it's definitely measured over the lifespan of the page. And I, again, this example of the banners is really great. Um, so Google Web Dev had a, ba um, a banner example where if a cu uh, customer or a user were to click on a button and that button was to move down because a banner had to make some space, um, the user may click on a button that's like uh, press into payment or click payment. So yes, it is definitely um, measured over the lifespan of the page. Can't be an issue. Awesome. What's next? God, this is more exciting than doing a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> is Rum going to help me solve cohort vital issues in my app? Well, of course, uh, we hope so. Um, but we really do recommend that workflow of using the tools you might already be familiar with or your um, SEO marketing team, your business analysts might already be using um, because Google is great at giving you recommendations on specific fixes. And then RUM is really good at correlating that to your real users and your real traffic. So use them in parallel and then we're confident it is this setup is going to help you solve these, these issues that are causing bad performance for Cola Vitals. First input delay can be caused by slow blocking scripts. Will RUM allow me to see which scripts are causing a delay? Yeah, um, I think with uh, Lighthouse, I think this is really great um, question for in terms of do you reckon you use it in Lighthouse? Lighthouse is definitely great for this, but um, we would definitely recommend that you actually validate your results with an actual RUM tool. Um, so yeah, you can definitely measure it with RUM and to get the accurate results, you do want to be using a RUM tool, but um, Lighthouse is definitely also valuable in that sense as well. Awesome. And will RUM be able to show me which element is causing a layout shift? Oh yeah, I've actually seen this one come through from uh, customers a few times as well. It's like, how do I know what is doing the jumping on the page? Can we, can we see that in RUM? Do we see it in the waterfall? Um, we don't necessarily see the um, visual look at the element itself, 
but I feel like the uh, water ball chart really does, you can really actually be able to diagnose into where to target the specific um, elements themselves to see, like it could be an image as such, as the image is loading for a certain amount of time that it probably shouldn't be loading for. The uh, water ball chart can definitely um, target this. And again, uh, what I mentioned before, being able to export the water ball, water ball chart as a CSV, you can actually, um, um, actually diagnose into um, correlating which um, elements are actually in play. So that is also, yeah, again, very good example. But um, again, Lighthouse was also <laughs> something that I used in my discovery during the blog discovery and actually showed me a visual um, look at the specific um, layout shift that was causing it. But again, needed mm. to validate it in an actual run through itself. Yeah, and I think maybe be very careful with things that are coming from third parties right yes. so any assets that are being sent through uh, by somebody else they need to be clearly defined yeah. so you can reserve that space for it do we have more oh okay. here we go did i skip them no no oh okay well here is a new question i don't know if i skipped one andrew will alert us alert us to it oh no no blurry um cool Will my customers in countries with poor internet connections have worse Colorado scores? And will I be able to find this out in RUM? Well, um, I would assume that cumulative layout shift, your favorite metric, yeah. isn't necessarily impacted by poor internet connections. But yes, absolutely. We saw in the, in the demo um, that you can narrow down on specific geolocation um, if you are aware of, of some places having poor, poor internet connections and that you have a significant user group then you can look at that specifically and see how are they performing against these, these scores. I would assume that largest content contained per cent for today will be affected but that does not mean you can't improve things for, for those uh, users. Um, and you can absolutely find that out in RUM. You can uh, deploy some fixes. You can see if they worked and hopefully get those, uh, get the performance for those customers and those users across the line as well. And it's again also about prioritizing what countries as well, right? Like you mentioned before in the demo, what countries are actually most important? Where are your customers mostly coming from that you want to be targeting at? Um, mm. And I feel like in this case, there could actually even be um, solutions such as using CDNs to actually target which um, server you want to be um, getting your assets from to uh, serve it to your customers in that specific country. So again, I feel like it's all about prioritization as well, which Bianca mentioned. Cool. This person sounds like they're ready to go and get started. Will I need to update and upgrade anything to get cool as it does data? Uh, well, it's in there now. The affected users drill down is coming very, very soon. Everything else is currently in uh, real user monitoring. If you sign up now, you will get it immediately. Um, obviously, you need to collect a little bit of data for you to get this historic view, but that will start automatically when you set up RUM. The other thing to mention, maybe make sure you've got, if you're an existing customer, you've got real user monitoring set up, have the latest version of the Raygun 4JS provider. Yep, yep, and make sure that it's, yeah, it's only a few code snippets as well. So it's really easy to plug in and really easy to use as well. But it will take some time if you haven't used the RUM um, product before to collect some data for you. Awesome. So no update, no upgrade, no switching on, just set up reuse and monitoring as we recommend. Anything else coming through? Wow, look at that timing. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us this New Zealand morning and whatever time it is where you are, we hope that we were able to provide you with some useful information. If you have any more questions, if you'd like to see a demo again, if we can do anything else to um, convince you that Reagan Real User Monitoring is the right tool for you to help improve your customer experience for co -op vitals and of course a number of other metrics, then please reach out and we're happy to help and talk some more. 
otherwise i wish everybody a great day evening morning and see you at the next webinar thanks, thanks. see you guys